right, let's begin. So, hello everyone, and welcome to the Immersive Environments panel. Uh, I'll be hosting this uh, panel together with Vienna Bogosian. My name is Claudio Barzan, and I'm uh, also involved in the, in the VR industry as a professional uh, stance, uh, being the director of Myanmar Studio, but also in my uh, quality as a PhD candidate of the Technology Digital Future Program. We have uh, quite a panel tonight with experts from the industry, ranging from, uh, from uh, let's say, uh, the, the more, um, let's say, tool-based uh, system to education and to all of these kind of creative uh, realms. So we have a discussion which is going to, to cover the affordances and disruptive qualities of immersive environments and the technologies that uh, we, they are based on. We're literally, when we're talking about uh, the XR, which covers the virtual reality, the mixed reality, and the augmented reality, and how this can be used for the thinking, the design communication, and enhancing social spatial dynamics, especially during this kind of uh, problematic times of the COVID-19 crisis, but also looking beyond. So our guests are uh, Christopher Morse and Adam Chernick from the Shop Architects. We have David Menard from Unity Technologies, Gilliam Yan from uh, Fologram, and Alessio Gracini from Morphosis. So I would let uh, Biana introduce herself, and then we'll start the presentations uh, and uh, the discussions. Thank you, Claudio. I'm um, Biana Bogosian. I'm trained as an architect. Uh, I'm also an immersive media designer, uh, focusing on um, developing tools for urban environmental issues, uh, data-driven uh, issues, uh, and ultimately uh, storytelling uh, for uh, to rethink uh, uh, spatial uh, socio-spatial dynamics. So today's panel is uh, extremely uh, interesting in a way that we are going to touch upon not only um, tools and technology, but also um, the rethinking and uh, kind of repositioning that is uh, allowed um, based on the um, affordances and uh, possibilities of these tools. Um, so uh, if you guys could continue introducing yourself, David, if you could begin. Sure. Hi, my name is David Menard. I am a technical product manager at Unity Technologies. I'm in charge of everything that is AEC related, uh, which includes our new product, Unity Reflect. Um, I am based in Montreal, so this is in the evening for me. And I'll go ahead and pass it on to Adam. Yeah, uh, my name is Adam Chernick. Um, I help lead some of the research and development efforts at Shop Architects for virtual and augmented reality. And we build a whole bunch of applications that we're excited to talk about today. And I'll pass it to Chris. Yeah, uh, thanks. My name is Christopher Morse. Uh, I work at Shop uh, alongside Adam. Uh, working on VR and AR development. I also, uh, this past semester, was a visiting lecturer at the Department of Architecture at Cornell. Uh, so I'll hopefully be able to share some of my insights and some of the student work from that. Uh, Alessio? Can you hear me? OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Alessio Grancini, and I'm uh, a Xar developer at Morphosis Architects. My work let's say intersect design and technology and most likely everything related to Unity, uh, specifically when we do presentation for clients and when we do internal tooling for the, for the architecture office as well. And thank you for the invitation, Diana. Thank you so much for being here. I guess that leaves me. <clears throat> uh, my name is Glenn John. I'm one of the co-founders and the creative director of Fologram. And uh, since starting the company, I'm on sabbatical as a lecturer at RMIT University in Melbourne for the foreseeable future, it seems. Okay. I prepared a short uh, presentation highlighting their research and uh, technology and um, also uh, hopefully um, some of the um, some of the new and exciting work that they're doing. Uh, some of them are teaching, some of them are working in large companies. So uh, we're hoping that this um, presentation uh, or beginning of this talk would highlight um, some of the, where the industry is in terms of some of the leading uh, figures. And then we will uh, break into a talk um, looking at 
uh, each other's uh, or commenting on each other's uh, work, hopefully, and then addressing some of the questions that uh, we will put forward. Uh, it will be a, a casual session, so um, let's see. So, uh, Guillaume, if you uh, if you could begin the presentation, that would be great. Okay, just the usual Zoom check uh, that you guys can all see see the screen. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, so I've tried to keep this to five minutes, so it'll be pretty brief, I think. Um, already introduced myself, so we can jump straight into it. So at Follogram, um, we're really interested in making things in mixed reality. Um, this is partly because I think augmented and by extension mixed reality, since its conception as a term by two engineers at Boeing, has always been intended um, to facilitate kind of performing complex tasks. So originally to help with things like manufacturing aircraft wings. But something that we've identified is that there's really low hanging fruit for pretty much anybody that is in a profession that makes things for them to engage with mixed reality. And Fologram is a platform to help them help them do that. Specifically, Fologram is a software toolkit that connects uh, Rhino and Grasshopper to mixed reality devices. So the HoloLens 1, the HoloLens 2, uh, iOS and Android devices. Um, it's a bi-directional connection. So um, you're streaming what you see within those uh, CAD softwares to your device, but you're also streaming back gestures and sensor data from the device to parametric modeling environments in order to trigger changes in those parametric models and update what you then see on the, the device. So this facilitates building really simple interactive experiences within CAD software that creatives, architects, designers, artists, engineers already use, um, which is the important kind of value proposition, I think, for Fologram. A couple of quick examples of how this is being used, um, both in industry and within more speculative design practice. So assisting with reducing the time, cost and risk of complex construction, things like non-standard brickwork, uh, there's an, a fantastic opportunity here to essentially uh, make uh, complex projects more feasible working from mixed reality shop drawings rather than more conventional 2D documentation. So this is an example of an application uh, that was developed to assist with the construction of the Royal Hobart Hospital uh, down in Tasmania. Essentially it's showing exactly where every single brick needed to go in some 20 meter long benches that wove their way throughout that building. And the bricklayers would wear headsets, which would just show them exactly where each cut brick type needed to go within uh, the construction site, within the context um, that they were working in, uh, whenever it was needed. So this is what you see through the headset. Essentially, it's a simple representation um, of where each brick needs to go. You're performing simple visual checks to make sure that the construction is matching the design intent. And this facilitates a couple of things. Uh, constructing complex projects in parallel, um, so by multiple bricklayers working from one shared holographic model and reducing the chance of sort of accumulative error by always being able to see what the end result is. Uh, more recently, we've been working on, as I mentioned before, very speculative um, projects, really trying to push the limits of what we can design and build when we work with mixed reality for fabrication. So this is a, a project that was done in um, collaboration with Simin Hanum and Igor Pantic at the Bartlett uh, for a small pavilion in Tallinn. And essentially the way this project became feasible, it was a tiny budget, was we worked with holographic instructions to steam bend all of the parts in the structure by hand. Um, same with all of the steel parts, we were bending everything by hand and by eye with cheap analog tools. And this enabled the design to be very tolerant of, um, I guess, minor errors in the fabrication. It allowed us to adapt things on the fly because we weren't prefabricating anything. We were able to visualize where all of the parts uh, needed to go on site, which essentially helped us work with very, very cheap, very, very lightweight, very, very flexible material um, and put together something which could actually structurally perform stand up um, 
get signed off on and uh, meet the design intent of the project. So a couple of quick images of that and just a short video showing you the scale um, of this thing with some people walking through it on site. Uh, very, very recently, so since COVID, um, we've been working on some extensions of these tools. So essentially ways to recreate design studio culture online by being able to quickly publish models from CAD software to web browsers, uh, share those models with anybody, and eventually uh, interact with them through immersive technologies. So this is a couple of quick videos showing these sorts of um, shared mixed reality environments in a web browser, which hopefully we can discuss more later. All right, I think that's pretty much my time. Um, I'll stop sharing. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Um, David, uh, could you uh, present uh, your uh, presentation, please? Uh, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear. There we go. This helps. <laughs> okay. So I'll assume uh, that most people here already know about Unity. Uh, so what I'm going to do is try and dig a bit more about Unity Reflect and what we bring to the table with this new tech. Um, but before that, just actual Unity. So the company itself was born in video games. Uh, that means our legacy was creating real-time experiences, interactive, immersive, real uh, real video games in immersive worlds. Um, in the past few years, though, we've seen a lot of companies starting to adopt this technology for a lot of different use cases. Uh, architecture is one, but we've also seen a lot of construction, a lot of uh, auto shows, uh, manufacturing across the board. We're seeing more and more interest for real-time 3D and, by in parallel, immersive environments and XR. Um, there was one big problem with those use cases, though, and that was that it was kind of hard to get different types of data into a real-time 3D environment. And this is why we built Reflect. Essentially, there were three big problems with the classic pipeline to bring in 3D data into a real-time environment. The first one that was that when you use a tool like Revit, uh, there's a lot of metadata attached to your objects. Uh, we call this bin data, of course. You all know this. But when you go through a file format like FBX into you know, Unity or Unreal or your engine of choice, uh, all that data is essentially lost completely. And all that hard work you put in to put that data in, you can't use it in your real-time experience to kind of augment that, that and present it the way you want. The second problem is that Real-time engines were made to consume what we call curated data, so curated experiences built by designers or game designers or game artists. And the data that comes from CAD, <laughs> CAD software like Revit is really not meant to be consumed in real time. Uh, so typically, when you wanted to create one of these experiences, you had to go through a process we call data preparation through a software like 3ds Max, where you merge objects together, reduce geometry, you know, work your materials, then go into your real-time engine. And really, the third problem was the iterative aspect of your projects. Um, because of this data prep process, every time something changed upstream in your source data, you'd have to go through this process time and time again. And that was just super cost inefficient, meaning every time you had a change, you had to go through these steps. And it could take days, if not weeks, to go through this. So with Reflect, what we've built is that way of bringing that data into real-time experience. And the way it works is really, I'll skip the video, is really easy. We have our um, plugins in the third-party applications, so Revit, Navisworks, SketchUp, Rhino, whatever you wish. And those plugins will push the data to the Reflect service. Um, the server can be on the cloud or on your device. It doesn't matter. You don't have to use the cloud if you want, don't want to. And then that data uh, is then pushed onto your device of choice. And that can be iOS, Android, Windows, whatever you choose, but it can also be the Unity editor itself where you can enhance that data. So the reason it's interesting is because there is a live link between 
the source data and the application itself. So if you change some, all of that data flows and is updated in real time into your viewers. Um, that it also that's also a multiple to multiple connection. That means that if you um, if you connect to this data, as many people as you want can see it in real time changing. And on the flip side, you can also has it as have as many sources feed the data into the Reflect project as you want. So you can have two Navisworks projects, one Revit project, one Rhino project, all syncing together into this Revit project. And on the other side, you can have as many people watching that data, and it's really platform agnostic. So you can have someone on their desktop in a meeting room, another person with their VR headset, another, another person on the field, on the actual construction site, viewing that data and seeing those changes in real time. And really, the, uh, the powerful part behind this platform is because uh, Unity is a development platform at its core, is the viewer that we give, uh, where you can actually see the data, um, we hand off a bunch of functionalities out of the box, like navigation, selection, all the stuff you would expect. But we also hand off the source code for those things. So if you have a very specific workflow that you're targeting or a very specific pipeline that you have embedded in your, uh, in your company, you can take this pipeline, you can take this viewer and customize it the way you want. And this allows you not only to work on one project at a time and create your immersive experience for let's say your hospital project that you have, but suddenly your Viz team can work on this template of a viewer and, this, and essentially um, propagate this project to every single project you have in your firm. So suddenly your Viz team is not bottlenecked by having to prepare your data and work on one project at a time. They can work on all projects that you have ongoing at the same time. And this is typically where I start going into use cases and showing what our clients have done with this. But uh, look, luckily today, we actually have Adam and Chris with us. So I'm just going to stop here and pass it along so that they can actually show what they've done with this stuff. Thank you very much. This is very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, it was a pure coincidence, okay. right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so Adam, uh, could you begin your presentation, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the intro, David. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, a, a little bit about, you know, we're going to dive into, you know, what we've been doing with Unity Reflect, um, but we're going to also touch on, you know, just to start who we are. If you haven't heard of Shop Architects, we have uh, built uh, a lot of buildings um, that are pushing what is possible within architecture. Um, here are just a few of our recent projects. Uh, and then I will continue through um, and, and speak a little bit about our team specifically. Uh, we've done a lot of projects in New York City, but then also have projects all over the world. Uh, just really quickly, kind of how Shop was born, um, it was born out of the idea that architecture is inefficient. The processes that we use are archaic and we think that we can do better. Um, and so the founders actually wanted to derive a lot of the mentality from automotive and from aerospace as, you know, thinking about a building as a, a kit of parts uh, so that we can uh, come up with new strategies uh, for creating architecture. And to speak about our team specifically, um, we build uh, a custom software. Uh, we really are trying to connect these larger pieces of design, data, and then the physical environment. Uh, we use a whole bunch of different tools to build these pieces of software. Um, and we build, we build software for uh, many different mediums, whether it is a virtual reality headset or a browser, web browser. Um, so we're gonna speak really, really quickly about some of the things that we do um, and, and things that immersive technologies and real-time technologies enable. Um, you know, kind of the lowest hanging fruit here is still images, right? We can um, create still images, 360 degree images and walkthroughs um, from these immersive environments that we're building in real time. But we can do many, many more things once we begin to write custom code into these 
uh, into these real-time engines to, um, to create interactive applications. So um, this first application really quickly is, you know, a scope box tool so we can actually laser point with a, um, cons with a facade consultant to speak uh, specifically about a connection detail in this facade. Really what a lot of these tools are trying to do and the power of, um, of real-time engines is to increase communication. Um, and so here is a, an assembly training tool uh, where, you know, now we get to immerse these uh, potential um, boots on the ground subcontractors on how this assembly process should go. Uh, we're able to overlay and augmented these models so that we can see how you might disassemble um, a, a piece of this interior facade system. Um, and then, you know, we can go and, and see how that facade system fits within its context. Um, this is an acoustic simulation. We're, we're doing a whole bunch. I'm going to kind of run through this because I know I'm going to run out of time, but these pieces of technology, Unity, uh, these other game engines, as well as a lot of software development kits that third parties are building are really enabling a huge range of different opportunities that we can capitalize on within AEC. Um, this is a hollow uh, lens based headset uh, assembly process, uh, proof of concept, and then diving into, you know, laser scanning, how that facilitates communication from, uh, from a construction site. A really important thing right now is that, you know, we can't have tons of people on construction sites right now because of, uh, because of COVID and, you know, how do we facilitate communication in new ways uh, using scanning? Um, this is an augmented overlay on top of a construction site. And then this again is speaking to Unity Reflect and how do we actually bring that building information model data uh, into the construction site and overlay it in one-to-one -one scale and uh, be able to, um, you know, find impact and, and make decisions. Um, we're able to, you know, give boots on the ground, give these subcontractors and general contractors the information that they need quickly because of new pipelines that are now possible because of this new technology. We can overlay this building information data and then, and then give them that information much more quickly than having to flip through thousands of pages of drawings. Um, this is a new VR cave that we've built out in our office in Manhattan. Um, and we're trying to find new ways of using this, this new medium, this, these new immersive mediums. So we're connecting mobile applications to these VR caves to cycle through drone footage at this 90 called tower in Brooklyn. Um, and then we're doing some movement simulation. So we're using Unity Technologies uh, nav mesh system uh, and their uh, artificial intelligence library to uh, figure out how people are gonna move through space. And we're actually using transportation data and occupant load data from our projects in order to see how people are gonna begin to interact with these spaces and, and validate our designs. Um, this is you know dropping a building on top of its construction site in one-to-one -one scale and walking around it to see how it's going to look within its context. Uh, and then, you know, how do we localize these models? We need to figure out how, how to drop this building into the correct spot. So we're looking at different ways of letting the uh, application itself recognize uh, the surroundings that, that it is currently in. Um, and then this is the last one that I'll speak about really quickly is, you know, trying to bring, bring all the pieces together. Can we design in virtual reality and then mill using, uh, using robotics and then use augmented reality and fullogram here is actually what we used in order to uh, assemble uh, the pieces that were just uh, created downstream um, in this new uh, immersive way. So these are some of the things that we've been working on. Um, and we're really excited to kind of expand a little bit further um, in the rest of this talk. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to see the, the range from AR, VR to the cave. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Chris, if you could uh, continue, that would be great. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's always so much fun to participate in these in part because I get to be reminded myself of like, all these really fun uh, things and, and see fun things from other people. Um, I, I am very lucky in that in addition to working with Adam at SHOP, uh, I also get to teach at Cornell. Uh, and so I'm just going to show a, a few quick, they're very rough videos of uh, some of the work for my students from this past semester. And I need to share my screen in order to do that. Uh, so one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, is how to use virtual reality within the design studio. Uh, so we have a studio of 15 students. Everyone has a headset, had a headset at their desk when we were actually on campus in school. And so how do we design uh, using the last example is tilt brush uh, to, to actually design in virtual reality. Uh, this current case, uh, a student created this um, software in order to present the design. So it's both the, the authoring of design as well as the presentation of design. So this whole presentation was in virtual reality, or at least it would have been had we all been there and were able to all share together uh, using multi-user. Um, so looking at different aspects of how to use it within the design process. Uh, additionally, um, one of the things that I personally really like to focus on is the interactive ability of immersive technologies. Um, and so in these immersive environments, we're not just showing something in 3D, we also have the ability to add user interface and add interactions and use that as a way to, to help tell a story about the, the project that, that we're discussing. Uh, so this was an exercise in augmented reality and the goal was to illustrate something about a project in augmented reality that couldn't have been illustrated in just a two-dimensional uh, drawing or, or, or pinup. And so these experiences, um, they're, they're not trying to tell the whole story of the project. They're not trying to be generic tools. Th these are very curated. It does take data prep work to get these into augmented reality um, in the same way that you might present you know, a very polished drawing differently than you would present your, your Rhino viewport in, in a uh, earlier crit, these tools can be ways to communicate and, and narrate these projects in ways that you couldn't do uh, in just two dimensions. So this uh, augmented reality exercise um, was, was all about that, it was about communication and about how the interaction uh, enables that communication. Uh, and I was, I'm so proud of these students. They, uh, the augmented reality part we got thrown into uh, when we all had to go home and uh, originally we were going to be doing more virtual reality, but we, we got a uh, sudden pivot and switched into AR and they really uh, took it up. Uh, this last one is actually the first one that I had the students do, but it's, it's also one of my favorite. Uh, this was an exercise in order to learn some of the tools and, and to think about them in ways that I personally don't get to think about a lot of times when I'm working on actual buildings. The, uh, the assignment here was to take a, a painting or a work of art and reinterpret it in virtual reality in three dimensions. And so a lot of the geometry came from Tilt Brush or it was designed in Rhino. Uh, things were animated. Uh, there was a lot of focus on the material aspect of these immersive uh, environments. And, uh, and this was just such a fun exercise in, in creating immersive space and thinking about the ways that these immersive tools can be used uh, in ways that maybe a lot of people aren't yet thinking about. Uh, and so this was, it's also just a lot of fun for me to, to break out of all the other fun stuff I get to do and uh, very exciting. And, and as, as we all know, I, I hope everyone listening to this um, understands that, you know, what I'm showing you here in a video does not compare to the actual immersive experience of being in these virtual environments that these students created. So this was really exciting. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. And I think this is a great segue into um, Alessio's um, presentation. Uh, so Alessio, take it away. Okay, let's go here. Can you guys see it? Yes. Let me see if I can. Some videos have the audio. I'm just gonna mute it when it starts because <laughs> I just put it on right now. 
Um, first of all, I wanted to say it's amazing to see all of the work that has been done. Also, I think it's very important in the last presentation it's been quoted how uh, education play a very important role in all of this Pixar revolution in design. And uh, and you know, I've been I've been coming out from school like two years ago, so I experienced that. Uh, I fully experienced this transition as a as a student and then as a professional. So I'm I'm very I'm very happy to see what will like that there is all of the two sides in this presentation. Uh, my very first experience with with AR come from uh, my thesis. It's not very much the first one, but it's been the the one that made me understand that I wanted really to work on this media seriously and I wanted to bring it to another level. These images uh, represent my thesis that was called uh, Games of Deletion and was a collaboration with a former employer of TikTok. Uh, his name is Runze, and he is an amazing uh, work, and we collaborated and developed together a demo for a game that was basically taking a lot of murals of, it, of LA and just like disrupt them and creating a portal between another space. So that's, that was all of our thesis and all of the consequences that were coming from them, a little bit fictional, staying in the climate of Sayark, but we, know, we all know that when you're a student, you can go a little bit crazier. Um, and then uh, it, it came to the serious stuff. Let's say here, uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a hackathon. And uh, this was actually, I, I, I like to bring up this video because for me, this was a kind of premature version of Reflect. Um, this was out of the Forge. And I worked with out of the Forge people coming down from San Francisco to LA. And they basically asked us to collaborate and building a demo for this Mira headset that right now became a standard headset for uh, architecture and construction. So it's very interesting for me to have seen like the evolution until Unity Reflect. When I saw Unity Reflect, I was like, there is going to be Autodesk in the middle of this. And in fact, Autodesk was, was there. So I, I'm very happy that I've been part of some indirectly of this change that came into architecture, even like seriously, even BIM oriented uh, uh, workflow that is something that brings a, a big a big change for all the workflow that is, is right now in the office of architecture. Um, this was another, this other takes from Reflect from inside of the headset. I'm gonna go very, very fast. But basically we were going inside this kind of house and getting all the metadata of this house in real time and seeing on a web uh, platform that would like interface whoever was watching VR with the web. So that was the main idea in the academic. Then I started to work in Morphosis, uh, and Morphosis has a very peculiar way to design, as probably everyone in this in this chat knows. They have a very heavy geometries, uh, impossible geometries to build, and uh, a great challenge for designer and for whoever makes it happen to to be you know to be uh, built, but also to be visualized, because we all know that. VR and AR have certain standard of performance, and so here it comes down really to how you treat the geometry, and you it's a, it's a full time job like how you treat this geometry before to get into into any platform. Uh, we also try reflect because I was very curious to see if this um, if this workflow if this workflow would be speeded up by the fact that reflect takes into account that this geometry needs to be optimized before it to be visualized and there is a optimized reduction that comes automatically with the platform. And I was very excited to try. We try, I think is a great asset to have for an architecture firm. And I always try to, let's say, push the company to use these tools that are available out there and, uh, and see where this can go. And, you know, like it's very hard sometimes from just one person to say, let's do it. Uh, when also you are comparing yourself to people that are working in that environment since 20, 30 years without really having a touch of what AR, VR is. So it's been for me also like kind of a uh, evangelism position toward Morphosis to say, hey, look, there is this available. Do you want to just like, you know. And um, this is, uh, we, we built a, a lot of articles to, sensi to um, augment the sensibility for XR in architecture since Morphosis seems to be um, for someone a reference in terms of architecture and design on some platforms we try to have like a lot of different articles to target and say hey this is possible uh, this can be done in a certain way there is also a, a full article on design boom that explains all the workflow to build a vr scene with the oculus and tracking so we kind of went very technical in that aspect and understand how to develop our own tools uh, inside of the office 
uh, this is a, a test we reflect. That was the heaviest, the, the heaviest model I ever imported in Unity. And uh, it's like a daily job for me, imported this monsters model with a lot of data and uh, trying to make it work in VR and AR. Sometimes 360 videos and 360 views are needed because, you know, it's impossible. Uh, but other, other time we always try to uh, have like the geometry alive there and make like changes in real time. Because as Adam uh, quoted before previously, it's very important uh, seeing this tool, not just a visualization, but also as a tool of design essentially, or possibly, right? I think that makes a, a big change for the profession too. Uh, this was some freelance project I've been working on. I, I'm a great fan of Unity. I build indie games in my free time. Uh, I, I do, let's say, stuff that actually matters during the day. And morphosis and this was uh, kind of in between between the two I tried to take some UI that belongs to some mobile games and I tried to implement like an architecture visualization into this mobile application that I built for a startup in San Francisco it's called Shilo Itzar that made like ADUA, uh, ADU houses for, for your backyard and this was another uh, the same same company they they build the same the same app but just for the magic clip. So I just tried to do to replicate the same in the yard but with magic clip. And even there it's just like an understanding, a new understanding of these tools that comes in, how can we use it? And everything that I do feed up the profession of being MFOSIS as an architect. Uh, these are other prototypes that we did internally. They really wanted to see explode and section. I think every architect when see for the first time is like I want to see the section in AR, I want to see the, the explode model in AR and uh, I was like okay let's do it uh, and here instead uh, I'm gonna just scroll through this is an animation made with Unity also too so procedural animation eventually turns out Unity that is a great tool to use also for doing very pretty stuff uh, beside actually uh, visualization or things uh, I'm gonna scroll over because this presentation belongs to my supervisor uh, I go to the section that is for the Milan Design Week. We built up a pavilion that basically was uh, was a mix of uh, projections and uh, AR. Um, so there were like uh, this this kind of very uh, minimal pavilion and plus, if you were a user, you could use the AR uh, the AR application that you could download on the stores and see certain parts of the Morphosis culture all of these buildings in a certain manner. Uh, there were some level of interactivity. It was actually kind of fun because a lot of people wanted to wanted to stay there and just do something. Meanwhile, the installation was not available. These are a lot of workshops that I did at school as a student. Uh, and I've been, let's say, co-teach with other teachers. They would ask me to be like AT or TA. Uh, and here, I always try to to just like uh, implement the use of Unity and see what are the possibility for the platform to do, to go. And I see that here there is a, a lot of Unity people, so it's it's cool to see you guys and that we are all in here. Um, this is uh, uh, just to finish up everything because it was a kind of long. Uh, sorry if I if I took too much time. Uh, this is like some free time experiment that I do here. It's basically the building a. You know, it's the structure of a building. It's there are floors, there are grids, uh, there are cores, and everything is like uh, um, let's say procedural built. So you just insert parameters, and you can actually decide how it speaks something. It's something like very BIM oriented, and I just like use it instead of using it as a tool at work. I just use it to create a game in collaboration with a, an architect called Andrew Kovacs that teaches at uh, USC. Um, and we are we and this is like it's it's just a, a a mobile application that I'm building at this moment, and you know if it, it, it's primarily fed by architecture uh, understanding of the space. So all of this way, or even if these are nice, pretty asset and colorful, like there is a very good uh, control structure behind of the game itself. And uh, for ending, like this is. Um, another game that I'm building in my free time, you know, like this is more of a traditional approach with Unity uh, uh, as, uh, as, you, as, you, as you describe Unity as a game engine, this is how I actually learned Unity in the beginning. So it, it, for me, like it's kind of back and forth between what can be helpful in gaming and what can be helpful in design as well. And here there are final uh, prototypes that we are building with the, uh, with the, um, 
uh, SDK that comes from IBM. It's called uh, Watson SDK, and basically it kind of makes you have like your chatbot inside of VR. And here, basically, we are trying to build a VR experience where you can have like this robot inside of your experience that chat with you and have like some sort of a sometimes some sort of reaction, some sort of learning process from the web application that EBM uh, Watson provide. So you can actually just talk to him in VR and it's it's like it grows up with you during from level to level. And that's his dancing. And yeah, that's more or less the same. Yeah. Thank you. That was everything. So thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. And it's very interesting to see how this kind of let's say technology bases are stemming into so many directions. Right, we're seeing this going to the academic front. We're seeing this going to the, let's say, beam or more professional front, but also going to this kind of entertainment and uh, let's say the ludology of uh, of, uh, of life. Right, and I think this is really important, especially in this context that we're facing now. I will start to say uh, the the panel discussion uh, based on the wonderful presentation and also about the, the technological aspects uh, to actually think about uh, or actually. Uh, let's say, propose a discussion around the theme of uh, this kind of new affordances, but also of the disruptive character that these technologies bring to the table. And we can also tackle the negatives and the positives, right? Because uh, we are talking about a new technology. Of course, as any new technology, you have the, the, the new factor, the, the amazing, the, the, let's say, the, the fascination, but also we can maybe touch upon some of the, the downsides or potential issues that you can face. And of course, we can discuss this in the wider conspect of uh, aspect, sorry, in context of, um, of let's say mixed realities. So combining uh, virtual reality or talking about augmented or all of the everything in between, basically, right? So I think this will be an interesting topic to to, to approach, and then also probably fa frame this into the context of the current situation because I think this is something that will probably revolutionize or have a major impact in how virtual realities and augmented realities are going to to move forward. So. So we are discussing about the COVID situation, but I think this is something that uh, even before that, the technology was disruptive. After or during this crisis, I think there are so many new ways and opportunities, but also again the caveats of of, of, of being uh, physically separated. So I'd like to to, to maybe throw this question um, onto the table and, and get your your inputs uh, about this. I'm not sure who wants to <laughs> to pick up uh, maybe. Was there a specific question that seemed like a, a lot? Yeah, for example, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let, let's put it like, like this. Okay, what are the, the say, we talk about the disruptors, right? So how do we frame that into a positive or context disrupt, uh, negative disruptors? How, what, what is the perception that you, from your experience and uh, from different frames, like from an academic, from professional, from enterprise world, do you see as uh, this kind of coining the term of disruptive technology associated with VR? Uh, really yeah. I'll start, I guess. Um, I wouldn't say specifically VR, uh, but the oh, ability yeah. to render in real time three-dimensional geometry, uh, I think is contributing to the disruption in, in terms of how we deliver buildings, right? The something that we're very focused on at shop. Uh, currently, you, you have this ridiculous process of designing an entire building in this 3D modeling software and then cutting it down into this giant stack of two-dimensional yeah. drawings which then gets redone into 3D by general contractors or whoever. And, and that process is just, doesn't need to happen. There's a lot of mistakes that come through that. And, and so having 3D information, and, and that touches pretty much everything that people here have said. It's, it's about communicating. It's about getting the data from one place to another. Um, it's about visualizing it. But I think there's, there's huge disruption potential in 3D data being sort of the source of, source of truth and being the deliverable from the architect to the people uh, building the buildings. Yeah, I think I was, I was thinking about, um, about affordances and, and disruption as two slightly different things because I think um, like uh, from our point of view, you know, trying to use mixed reality to make things, there are three key new affordances there that are going to have a big impact. I mean, the first one is being able to interact with spatial data in an intuitive way without needing to learn any complex user interface makes that technology very, very accessible. Like the barriers to engaging with some mixed reality application just disappear. The second affordance is that because um, mixed reality environments can be shared, they afford 
pretty unambiguous, clear communication about spatial data. So you don't need to understand how to read a plan, for instance, to understand what a what is about to be built. And then the third one, I think, is um, if you're able to precisely position spatial data uh, in the context in which it's going to be used, then all of a sudden you have, you it affords, again, to use that term, like very reliable, rapid, low cost and low risk implementation of mixed reality within practices of making things. So that has the impact of suddenly upskilling every single craftsperson, tradesperson, artisan, maker, and enabling them to participate in digital production chains. Like that's a huge potential impact. So these people are previously being left behind as uh, we shift towards, let's say, full automation of um, various aspects of construction. And now I think there's an opportunity for them to participate uh, in ways of, of building, which are kind of new and fundamentally sort of more uh, rewarding, let's say, for, for people that use their hands to make things. Yeah, I really do like the, the, the point you brought up with the, just, or that everyone brought up with the collaborative aspect of it. Like um, in virtual reality, in these real time environments, you, you are able to let's say run experiments that you wouldn't be able to in real life. Whereas um, I, I have in my mind the examples of, you know, VR chat and alt space VR all the time where you can put a bunch of people in a space and see how they will interact before a space even exists or, you know, without the necessary boundaries that you have in real life and see how that will actually affect them. And that's actually where I think there's a lot of affordances for these immersive technologies, just because there's a lot of stuff you just can't do. And it really comes from that fantasy of the video game world where you can actually start bringing it in into real work, essentially. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, um, you know, you're giving it gives us all superpowers, right? So we we yeah. can teleport now, right? Uh, we can uh, we can uh, have stretchy arms and grab things and pull them to us, and you know whatever we really want to do to um, to facilitate again this communication that um, wasn't possible before. Sorry. If I can add something, uh, it's uh, definitely upscaling the, the the field of architecture as an industry as well, uh, and probably that's the most uh, strong impact I I could see as a as a as a person in the field of architecture. Like um, we all know that more your your uh, let's say your job uh, implies automation or like tooling, and there is all a different level of speed. In the production, uh, you probably have better results in terms of uh, economics of your product. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that for me uh, helps a lot, quite quite a lot of architecture because we all know, especially in in a lot of school, um, architecture is uh, taught in a way that uh, it's not uh, from my point of view. This is personal, maybe, uh, but as a as a student, I felt many times that. Uh, there were some sort of uh, late update or some sort of s stuff that was actually not really uh, showing what you would have met eventually outside of school. And uh, I think this is common probably in many different fields. The fact that school is different from work, that I mean, that's totally understandable. But the gap that we see in architecture between the availability of technology and the use of technology is quite a very wide, wide gap. And uh, definitely the use of this technology helps a lot to line up these two components and gives like some justice to actually the work that you're doing as a designer. Uh, you touch up on so different, so many different elements. It's sometimes it's hard for me to define what I'm actually working on because there are so many things that you could say I'm an editor, I'm, I'm a developer, uh, I, I kind of fix bugs and I also create a UI like it's it's all a full, a full range of 360 things that, you know, at the end, uh, you, you need to be capable of having all of these skills as a designer. Um, so I, 
I think that really, sorry, downtown LA here, and 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 really changes the attitude of design uh, right now in this contemporary society, definitely. So speaking of sirens and chaos, uh, I wanted to um, further bring up the the COVID crisis. Uh, before this, uh, I'm currently a PhD student at the School of Cinematic Arts, um, where I'm doing field work, collecting data, and, and making an AR IoT app. But then my day job is teaching in Miami and Florida International University, where we were developing um, AR and VR training for robotic arms. And as soon as the uh, crisis happened, I picked up uh, my Vive Eye and then my computer and then packed and came back to LA to finish the field work here. And, um, and I would say that um, my work was not disrupted at all. I was able to obviously communicate with my team looking at the same models, using different techniques, uh, different um, file sharing, um, resource sharing, looking at the same views. Uh, so uh, in a sense, um, and then today actually we had to present the, the, a demo to National Science Foundation. So we had a pre-recorded video, but then we were able to uh, actually do a real-time demo to them. So these people that are going to, let's say, fund our projects, they were able to look at a, uh, a screen of one of our teammates uh, showing them what they were doing. Um, so um, in a sense, like uh, work-wise, um, maybe my personal workflow hasn't been interrupted, and maybe this is the case for most of us that are uh, maybe working with technology that allows us to communicate with one another. But um, there's obviously other aspects that are starting to resurface. So today um, in our class, um, we were, uh, a lot of the conversation was about um, actually uh, social distancing and, and how maybe um, uh, this experience of uh, isolation could start to enable us to then create uh, maybe better or more informed multiplayer uh, experiences. So this is something that everybody right now is experiencing. They're understanding the importance of, uh, of working in teams or uh, collaborating with one another. And it was so much easier to kind of put, to, put forward to the students or encourage them to, let's say, look at a multiplayer version versus uh, maybe a first person version because it was easy to talk about how we miss being in city together or how we uh, you know, miss hugging or, you know, so, it, so in a sense, these are things that they were able to do, right? So uh, obviously it's a very exciting time where, let's say, IEEE VR was able to, in two weeks, completely migrate to Mozilla Hubs. And, uh, and this is a trend that we're starting to see with a lot of conferences, right? Also with, uh, with a lot of um, current innovation going towards web VR uh, or web XR, right? So it's, Sometimes it's, um, it's, it's uh, we need to kind of distinguish uh, or maybe look at it in a very generic sense. So, so I'm curious if you guys could elaborate on um, on um, maybe your view of the technology. I think everybody here believes that there's potential here. We're excited about its influence on our field um, and whether we're looking at uh, maybe more uh, traditional uh, architectural uh, firms or maybe not traditional. So I think that's a given here, but I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how your view uh, has changed. Uh, and I want to start off by asking uh, Gillian, because your web-based platform, um, you started to kind of talk about it in the context of a recent thing, uh, in a sense, uh, you, you, uh, because it is truly a necessity, right? So uh, currently we rely on Zoom and, and um, let's say, uh, doing uh, markups uh, in a very primitive way. So I was wondering if you can elaborate on that and if everybody here could, uh, could elaborate on that fact and uh, just thinking about how uh, your uh, maybe view of the technology or speed of development has changed uh, due to current situation. Thank you. Yeah, we'd be, I'd be really happy to talk about that. I mean, I think um, the COVID-19 crisis has obviously... Uh, led to this sudden shift to remote work and remote learning. And I think even once 
if and when the the um, the global lockdowns sort of recede, they'll leave a lasting impact on on how and where we work and how and where we learn. I mean, we're not going back to um, things as they were before, and the reason I believe that is is just because, in my experience, I've of, of the people who I know who are teaching design, um, almost all of them say that some aspect of their design teaching will remain online even if university campuses opened because it's more efficient to teach some classes online and there's certain advantages and benefits to it. Um, and the same is true of work. I mean, the, the freedom and flexibility to work from anywhere rather than being forced to commute into an office, you're already seeing very large tech companies um, you know, allowing their workers uh, to work remotely for the, well, pretty much, you know, the next 12 months. Um, I think this is going to have really significant impact. And from our point of view, it provides incentives to develop the next generation of remote learning tools and remote work tools. And let's face it, they utterly suck at the moment. They're terrible. Um, Zoom sucks. All the VR remote meeting tools, complete uh, apologies to all of them. The reason they suck is because all of a sudden there's a sudden need. And so that, that demand hasn't actually been met with a kind of rapid iteration and, and um, experimentation of what a good remote work and remote learning tool looks like yet. Um, so it's nobody's fault. It's just that there's going to be huge opportunities to innovate in this space. And I think that the opportunities are going to be to develop mixed reality remote collaboration tools. And the reason I say they're going to be mixed reality rather than purely screen based or um, purely virtual is because you need an effective way to communicate. And that means that you need to be able to communicate your body in any virtual space. You need to be able to communicate your gestures, your facial expressions, and that needs to be blended with some virtual environment. Um, I think the problem with Zoom is it's just tiring to sit here and kind of look at yourself and look at everybody else to so these virtual backgrounds and try to remain kind of, you know, focused to normal. It would be, more, and I'm not able to express myself in the same way that I would if we were all sitting around a table together. It would be more effective to do that in a virtual environment with some layer of abstraction, I think, over the representation of ourselves that's able to still communicate the way we would naturally, you know, or convey how we would communicate naturally. The other thing I think there's a massive opportunity for is in, in bringing parts of the physical environment into remote workspaces. So for instance, doing any kind of on-site maintenance, any kind of virtual site visits, any time kind of training within physical spaces, you know, let's say within medical industry or something like that, you need to understand what a physical space really looks and feels like. And I think there'll be opportunities for remote work and learning tools that are situated within, let's say, digital twins or within 3D scans or whatever you want to call it, like copies, simulacra of physical spaces that are like, enable effectively like telepresence um, from one space to another. Like there, there isn't really a good application that does that yet so there's a huge opportunity there and um, finally from from our point of view we're interested we're lazy at Fologram really we only we only pick low hanging fruit the lowest hanging fruit from our point of view is to try to just recreate the experience of a design studio online um, how do you make a pin up a desk create a formal presentation an exhibition and how do you make that feel like it does in a design studio you know sort of a physical space and so that's what our app studio platform is trying to sort of recreate but it's a it's a covid project so much like everybody else we're still figuring it out but i think um it's our first kind of stab at, at building something like that for remote collab i i would love to uh comment on that i thought that was you know pretty spot on um but it i also have a few kind of maybe contradictory thoughts just in terms of um, it, it, it seems like you need everything, right? Uh, you, you, you need to have a, an immersive environment, but you also need to not have an immersive environment. Similarly to how you guys uh, have already figured it out at Fologram, right? You have, you can use an AR headset, but you can also use mobile because, you know, adoption isn't there yet, right? So as we're trying to hit these, you know, uh, these different groups of people, 
um, they're going to lend themselves to, you know, different devices and different user experiences. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, it's an interesting time where you kind of, to, to really gain that adoption, you kind of have to have everything. You have to have it work on the iPad and browser and the headset to be immersive and slowly, right? It's a spectrum in my opinion, where, you know, slowly we'll move more and more towards that immersive environment as, uh, you know, as the tools become more accessible, become more intuitive, um, but, uh, but, until that adoption is there to facilitate that adoption. I think you kind of need, you know, all of the different mediums to, 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 to move in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely with Adam on this one as well. Uh, I, I think you do need cross platform for this kind of thing to really, really catch on. Um, but in the same virtual environment, essentially, that iPad talking to the XR device or whatever else you have on your on your desk, essentially. Um, but I really like the way, Biana, you put it when you started the question with, you know, bringing different tools together on different jobs. Essentially, you can only do so much in a Zoom meeting. Uh, eventually, you're going to need a post-it note. Uh, you're going to need a board. And eventually you're going to need context for your 3D model. And that tool, that collaboration tool, there's no perfect one. And you're going to keep switching between these contexts. So I don't really know yet what the fiber or what the connecting fiber between all these experiences are. And that's what I'm really curious to see what's going to come up after uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, like you said, Willem, I think there's just huge opportunity for someone to show us the way there. <laughs> mm. Agreed. Sorry, right, once again. Um, I just don't want to let you hear the sirens while you guys talk. And um, what I what I used um, recently has been this tool by developed by Mozilla. Uh, it's called Spatial. And like I just wanted to point out this tool because I think that's a good at least a good start for what I think about cross-platforming and uh, spaces. Like it's, it's, it's such a nice tool like that I've been using some, it's very simple, like it's nothing crazy, honestly. I don't think, I think you have actually a limit for uploading models and like definitely not the, 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 the end of, of this conversation, probably just the start. Uh, but it's very, it's very nice because you can interface a web uh, and VR together and you can have a chat and at the same moment you can upload models and then you can share your screen in space. Uh, it's something that I didn't, I never seen together. I've seen a lot of these small prototypes around, but I never seen actually a whole platform together. And made, I have to say, made a huge difference uh, in a lot of meeting I, I, I've done. And, and primarily it was so much more fun than, than everything I used before. So, and um, communication is special. So it's just like, you're far from me and I don't hear you. So eventually if we are in 10 in this room, I can just talk to this guy and I'm not gonna hear the same level of the other guy there. This is something I saw in many chat room uh, on Steam um, as well. Uh, some VR chat rooms and um, Oculus and stuff like that. But like definitely a lot of room for improvements and providing like a version of what you think is what it's needed now. Uh, definitely seeing VR and, and AR as a, how can I say, like a media that is providing a lot of investigation before then solutions right now. And uh, a lot of industries are trying to, to provide like their own, their own take on it, but it's still pretty wild out there, I, I can sense. Yeah, I, I think that that's also an exciting uh, thing is kind of this massive and growing ecosystem of, you know, of tools and of libraries and of software development kits that we can plug into, you know, these other tools um, and connect these dots that, you know, previously 
were maybe possible to connect, but I'm not a backend engineer, right? So now I, I don't need to be, in order to connect those dots, we don't need to have this massive team. We can have a small, um, you know, nimble team uh, to, to do these things. It, it, this, this growing ecosystem of underlying technology that it, it can now be connected is incredibly exciting. Coming from uh, the tech point of view, this situation, I love it because there's still no competition yet in this area because there, it's it's not mature enough. So everyone has their space. It, it's just such a great place to be in right now because you're not eating at market share. You're just growing the market, everyone together. <laughs> so I just want to add um, one more sort of thought that connects to all this. What were, I think everybody here sort of saw the benefits of a lot of this for a while, and it's it's in some ways a relief that everybody else now sees it, and, and to some extent that makes the, the evangelizing a little bit easier. Um, looking forward, you know, it's not going to be one or the other, it's going to be a hybrid, so we're already looking at you know, classes in the future or the office. Some people are going back, some are not going back, who goes back will change from day to day or week to week. And so the, the, whatever sort of ecosystem that ends up evolving to, to facilitate that communication is going to have to take that into account as well. How do you make the experience of four people in a room and two people remote, how do you make those two people have the same experience as those four people in the room? Um, personally, you know, I've been working remotely since last August, and, and there was a big disconnect between people in a room and me being remote, now everybody's on Zoom, at least there, there is a, sort of a sense of equality. We all have the same experience. It's a very limited experience, but it's it's the same experience. Um, and so I think that equilibrium is going to be a, a very exciting and interesting challenge. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, uh, and based on uh, these kind of discussions and about this kind of uh, presence that needs to be, in a way, made more, let's say, equitable uh, from, from the immersion perspective, but also from the effective perspective. Because I think one of the reasons that we are facing this kind of uh, problems is not necessarily that the Zoom is limited, that's one part, of course it is. But it's also the fact that you feel disconnected, all by now maybe equally disconnected, which is a little bit different than it was before. However, so part of my PhD research, for example, uh, looks at uh, a little bit into the future and sees, okay, uh, how do we include the, the, the effective uh, and the empathic elements to actually bring uh, building this kind of future virtual worlds? And also, how do you actually uh, monetize in a way, metaphorically speaking, on the fact that you're no longer bounded by the, the say, tectonics and the, uh, like the, the material limitations? So basically, you could build worlds that are completely, let's say, um, uh, crazy even but they can also be relating very well to your empathic uh, interests. So, for example, how does a space evolve in which two people and then three people and more people are joining in? Should the space be static? Should it be a reference of a, a cafe in Paris or some kind? Or can it be a dynamic space that somehow uh, hints to whatever we feel as humans as reliable to, to the space? I do believe that floating in midair is a very bad idea because you don't have this kind of uh, spatial connection that we are used to having from the days where we are living in, in, in this kind of uh, caves, right? Because space has always been a reference for us, uh, albeit a protective space or any kind of space, you, you have a relation to the space. Now, how is that, uh, from your perspective, how is that relation going to change? How, uh, because we have, in now we have a lot of, let's say, technologies. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Unity, using Unity in our studio a lot, because it's actually very flexible and because it's actually adopting the early technologies, everything, we're using a lot of, let's say, brain computing interfacing. So the newest things that appear will always have this kind of first uh, first uh, implementation in, in an engine like Unity because it's flexible, right? So it adopts and it allows, like you said, that a small team now can tackle uh, research experiments or even design tasks that before were only available in somehow, let's say, a restrictive laboratory environments with very expensive million dollars of, uh, of uh, worth of equipment. So my, my point to me or my question would be, how do you envision beyond this kind of, let's say, the present, how do you envision a little bit more, looking more into the future, into the Black Mirror like uh, <laughs> like realms? How do you do you envision the the future participatory spaces? How do you envision the, the, and then again, with the positives and the negatives, I'm also very much interested in the alienation that risks to happen, and also in the craziness, because if you remember when the web was launched, everybody was creating those kind of super pop-up, crazy, marquee-based uh, 
because they just because they could and because they're probably moving away from a static uh, uh, perspective of paper printed paper right so they wanted their, their their experiences to be as flashy and as as uh, i don't know as dynamic as possible however uh, that proved to or that led to the creation of those kind of crazy well, i would say uh, in a way interesting when you look back but uh, we're kind of moving away from that. We're moving to this kind of polished environment, minimalistic design, some great glitch gradients. art. I think you're talking yeah, about yeah. the glitch art. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So the, for, from the glitch art to this kind of uh, kind of more curated experience. So uh, I also want to raise uh, with, with this kind of futuristic approach. What do you think is going to be the the role of the design? Are we going to create spaces fully like we do now, or are we going to move into a more, let's say, a catalytic role, catalytic role in which we're going to enable uh, some some design strategies, some design uh, and even tool tool uh, systems, but also I'm talking about procedural systems, generative systems that are going to be basically driven by the emotion and interest and, and focus of, of people. But also, what is the role of the of the, of the future of the designer in that, that context? Because we won't be able to create the immensity of uh, of uh, virtual space that needs to be built. Either we talk about pure virtual or or uh, augmented spaces, right? So this is, I think, something very interesting to to talk about the, the future role of the of the space and the future role of, of, of the designer of these spaces. Okay, that would be the basically the question or the topic. So oh, kind of, that's another very very long <laughs> question. Um, I'll break it into three categories that, that I think of when I think of the future of space and how this affects that. And I'm not necessarily going to talk about all three, but, um, and, and not to say there's only three, but there's, there's the, the space that we design for experiencing in something like virtual reality, right? A virtual space can be whatever we want it to be. I mean, not whatever, but you know, we don't need gravity. We don't, we can have moving things. Different people could be in the same space, but see it differently. So they're in the same space, but in different spaces. And there's a lot of fascinating things that can go in. So what are these spaces that we're going to design in order to experience digitally is one part of it. Um, another part is how do these tools affect the spaces that we're designing for every day, eating, sleeping, working with. If the designers use different tools, the buildings that evolve are going to be different. So what, what are the spatial qualities of those buildings going to be? And then there's a, a third question in the middle is, how are the spaces that we design going to change in order to take advantage of everybody wearing AR glasses or everybody using VR headsets? So the physical space of the office is going to have to change when people are using VR. The, the way that we design wayfinding is going to change when everybody has glasses that can do wayfinding for them. So there's sort of three different areas. Um, I will, just because uh, you mentioned not just affordances, but also potential problems, I, I will just sort of bring up one that, that I'm concerned by, and that is um, the, the, the spatial perception of virtual reality. As you're designing space, there's an initial idea of virtual reality is, okay, now I can understand the scale of the space. Before I was on my screen and I was sort of looking from the outside, now I'm in it, now I can understand how big it is, how far it is. But there's a danger in that, you know, the, the teleporting is, is the big one. If I'm teleporting through a building, I can get from one end of the building to the other in two seconds. I'm not experiencing that space. I'm not understanding. I'm in fact getting a very distorted picture of that space because I'm in VR. So rather than giving me a clear vision, it's giving me a, a less clear vision of, of certain spatial qualities. And so that's just one of many potential dangers uh, related to a very long question. It's a double-edged sword in my opinion. Uh, you know, it's uh, maybe without that teleportation, it's a, it's a large site, right? It's a large project you don't have the ability to be in there for two hours, three hours, right? Teleportation is the, the best way to look at all of the feature spaces uh, and, and give them the most amount of time, um, you know, within these, within these featured areas that, um, that you want to highlight in your design. Uh, you can think about it both ways. Another thing I would bring up it's, uh, that connects to the very long question, uh, it's that um, you said basically how do you think design is going to affect these decisions in VR, that basically resuming all of the question. And I think also the, um, the architecture of the experience, that doesn't necessarily mean the model that you put in, but like the structure of your file, it's something that really makes you 
there is a lot of connection between what I think in terms of spaces that we're going to see and whatever is the structure of my, I don't know, I know it, it goes a little bit technical, but like the structure of my file that I really do when I, when I build this experience is like the fact that you deal with the possibility to switch between a space to another one and you really don't need a connection to go to get there. Uh, you don't need to explain everything. You just can create like a direct connection that you can teleport yourself there. And uh, the content that you're going to find there, how much this nesting of, of, of content is going to work, like how, how much, like how many things, how many steps you can go through and how you are creating like a template, let's say that, uh, that makes you feel you know how to go around the space. Like that there are some rules that are locked pretty much locked and you can have the understanding of what you're doing and a kind of intuitive way to do it. Uh, I think that's a very big challenge also. And I think that designers can take that very, very good as well. Like, because we, we, we've been educated as understanding how to, to, to go from one space to another one. And this is kind of the same, but it's just in a different media. So that leads you a little bit to a different kind of architecture that is more the architecture or the file that you're building. But uh, I find it very stimulating when I think about it. Like I find very stimulating tracks and diagrams of how this VR experience might be working. And uh, I find very like a, a lot of resonances between what, I, what I've been educated for and actually what I'm building right now with a different media. I want to uh, touch on something that Alessio said during his presentation. You mentioned that one of the first things that um, architects um, want to see is a section, maybe section through a building or an elevation through a building. Um, um, so I want to pause there and then uh, say a short um, story and then I'll come back to the question. Um, one of my uh, advisors at USC School of Cinematic Arts, uh, his name is Scott Fisher. He was a student of Ivan Sutherland. So he studied with Ivan Sutherland on early VR headset. He then went to NASA and did, um, and he co-founded the Atari Lab, etc. So he was very active in 1990s VR room. And um, when he's teaching his um, kind of mixed reality class, uh, introduction to mixed reality, um, He's showing this set of slides that are very interesting. So it's kind of history and theory of VR and AR. And then one interesting thing he does, he lists problems of um, the platform and kind of looking forward um, to what uh, you know designers and creative people want to see. Um, and then he lists certain things. And one of the big components is um, obviously one of the points is uh, technology advancements, um, making the device smaller. But one of the key elements here is actually content generation. The fact that we are still struggling with content generation, really understanding uh, not only uh, where um, you know this um, media could be suitable. So, coding Marshall McLuhan media uh, is the message. Uh, then, uh, but also developing ethics and uh, truly understanding ways to. Um, ways to um, analyze and uh, maybe um, even uh, ways that then this media could become part of a culture. And then uh, he shows us the, uh, the date of the slide, which is 1990, I believe, five. So what's really interesting is that um, he kind of tells us that a lot of the questions and a lot of the uh, investigations in the round of AR and VR has been ongoing. And then we know the famous kind of curve of how then the boom stopped and then they picked up again. So what's really fascinating about that is to really truly understand that um, you know, we're not really for the first time asking these questions or uh, dealing with these issues, but these are ongoing and these will continue to uh, to go forward. But I think one um, possibility that we have here is because prices are reducing, then this is becoming fairly readily available. There's more people generating content, so therefore we are able to having these conversations and afford them in, in, in universities and different offices. So um, going back to a question about uh, architects uh, interested in looking at sections and elevations, 
Uh, I'm curious if uh, pretty soon, at least in our industry, we need to start to think about um, perhaps a new building uh, representation codes. So in schools of architecture, you do get a certain handbook about understanding what's a, what's a hatching, what's a, a section cut, what's a line weight. So I'm curious if, um, if you maybe foresee um, actually a uh, discipline of architecture, uh, engineering and construction going towards that, right? So already there are certain conventions that we are starting to understand. But so, uh, so this is um, in a sense a question of representation and architectural representation. And, and if you see going forward, um, um, you know, new modes of representation becoming important. So uh, from layering to perhaps other conventions that do become the new sectional drawing. So again, that was a long question, but if you could kind of comment on um, basically um, new ways of engaging with architectural representation, that would be great. Thank you. I, I'll start again, I guess. Um, the, so the, the section cut specifically, um, in, in one of the videos that I showed from the students, and, and I didn't point it out at the time, and so people may have not noticed, there was a section cut. He was an AR section cut tool, but he had different buttons to specify which thing to cut, right? You could cut just the exterior. You could cut just the structure. You could cut just this. So rather than a, a traditional 2D section where you're cutting everything, um, you know, th this tool lets him cut only specific parts to reveal or hide different parts. So the, what I'm, the connection I'm making there is that idea of interaction that I also talked about before, that the, to me, the representation conventions that emerge from this move to immersive technologies is the ability to add interactive elements to the experience. And so what do you let the viewer change? What do you let them interact with? What do you let them touch? What changes when they touch that? That gives us a new way to add narrative and add story and add curated information to these experiences. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking more from the sort of very specific, you know, one-off experiences. Um, that's how I sort of see visual representation changing is the addition of user interface, user experience, interaction. I, yeah, I, I, go ahead, Adam. No, no, you go, you go. <laughs> uh, I, d I wanted to double down on that because a, a trend we've been seeing with different firms, and this is like super wide, we have a lot of firms that are very, very disciplined at their, getting their BIM data and their BIM models extremely um, concise and very, very precise so that they can use that data further down the process. And then we have the other side where it's just the Wild West. Anything goes. Um, so as, honestly, as immersive experiences and just real-time 3D experiences are being more popular, uh, we see the trend where most people are curating that initial model in a way that's tighter and tighter uh, for exactly the reason you said, Chris, to be able to take advantage of that data and make interactive experiences with them. Uh, one of an example of that, we've had one user who um, remade their entire door families in Revit to include pivot points so that when he brings those into uh, the real-time environment, those doors open by themselves. Uh, it's a very simple thing, but you go to that extent to really curate that experience so that there's no work to be done on the other side at the end. Yeah, absolutely. So short, I think, yes, there's absolutely going to be standards. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 I'm and I was thinking about that, I guess, slightly differently in terms of kind of like, um, you know, how visuals and how graphics and how iconography of these drawings, these section cuts, how those are going to change over time because of, you know, these immersive environments. I think it's a really interesting question, uh, and I think about this question often, uh, and um, and I think that it's going to take. Uh, time to see that change, of course, um, but but I think it's inevitable um, as mediums change. Uh, you know, these, this iconography, this language is going to change with it. Um, and, and you know, right now, a construction document set. Right, you have your section cuts, you have your uh, detail callouts, you have your you know all of these different 
elements within this language that's been developed in order to do this job, get buildings built, right? Um, and, and now as we begin to take those pieces of iconography that are so deeply rooted and deeply ingrained in AEC in this process, right, that's been the same for hundreds of years, uh, now this iconography, we're, because we need adoption, because we want to facilitate uh, the growth of this technology, we, we're, we're taking that iconography with us, uh, that language with us, so that uh, so that people understand what we're trying to do. They see that augmented section cut. They know it's a section cut because they know what a section cut icon looks like. They see that detail call out dash line because they know what that looks like. But, you know, and, and that's to help facilitate us moving in the, in the right direction. But, you know, I, I would argue over time, as people have seen that more and more, maybe a, a direct one-to-one -one correlation of a section cut icon living in an augmented space is not the right approach, right? It's clunky, it's big, it, it's, not, it's not a great user experience. Maybe it shifts into something much smaller. Maybe that, you know, maybe it, it, it's dynamic and it gets larger and smaller within this dynamic environment. Uh, I, I think this language and this iconography is gonna change you know, as, as the adoption happens. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to pick up on, on um, those comments, Adam and Chris, just from, a, from the point of view of a fabricator, like what, what information actually gets conveyed to somebody on site doing the work. So not from a design perspective, but from a, a contractor perspective. And what we found really interesting in working with mixed reality for construction, how you, how you, um, evolve like a set of drawings to a set of interactive contextual holographic information for building is that what you really want is exactly as Chris said, you want an incredibly simple user interface to show the minimal amount of information as possible. And you want that to be intuitive and like automated, essentially, you want the information you need to perform a task to be visible when you need it without interrupting the task at all, if possible. And th this is going to be, this is pretty exciting to us because reading a drawing, it really takes you out of one mental space and puts you into another. You need to think about something at scale through this kind of complex codified um, set of like symbols, essentially. You need to then abstract and reinterpret that drawing and visualize the space in order to then make decisions in a completely different physical space. Whereas when you're working within these immersive environments, the line between the physical and the digital blurs. And so what you really want to instead show is I, I didn't actually show it the slide in my presentation, but it's a fantastic slide. The Boeing guys back in the early nineties with the aircraft wings, their diagram shows a guy wearing this fancy headset, looking at an aircraft wing. And the only holographic information is one vertical line in one particular location. And that's perfect. Like that's what you want because you can't make a mistake. It's like, okay, I'll drill where that line is. It's done. And then you want to show where the line is for the next drill location. And so I think that, yeah, like drawings and conventions are just going to become 4D and they're going to become informed by both how a user interacts with that information and also informed by the physical sites that they're, they're used in. I think I don't have no idea what that's going to look like. Adam, I think your, your call on like how, how icons work in space. I mean, it's a really tricky problem. I have the same feeling about mixed reality user interfaces as I have about remote collaboration software. They utterly suck and uh, they need to get a lot better. I'm not the like Jesus who's going to solve this. But we might actually, right? we might be at a point where, where things are developing so fast that we're no longer able to develop conventions about, uh, about those interactions. You know, we, we had, uh, plans and sections for hundreds of years. We've had icons on a computer for tens of years. You know, the next tools that come out, we, we may be at an inflection point and there's just no way for conventions to develop because things are going to be going so fast. Um, so that'll be interesting. But I think maybe it goes back to what Claudio was saying. Uh, I mean, obviously, we know that the, 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 the new devices that are being released they are having eye tracking, other, uh, you know, biometric feedback. So I guess um, it's um, we we start to see that how obviously uh, with some of the early releases, how difficult it was to access some of this data. Um, for instance, uh, 
with Magic Leap, you know, you can only go to a certain point, and then with, uh, let's say, new releases, it's becoming more, the API is becoming more accessible. So, um, so I guess maybe um, it's just a matter of time until all of this becomes more uh, customizable, integrated, because, uh, you know, we needed architectural graphic standards um, because we had to assume that everybody saw the world the same way, right? So I guess that's not the case anymore. Um, I have a quick question before we wrap up, Alessio. I'm, I'm just curious because you're working in a firm that has gone through, um, you know, years of maybe working in a certain way, and now um, they are they have uh, your little unit that is trying to, as you said, you're the evangelist, but also, um, you know, it, it is an open-minded um, professional space that maybe. A little bit talking about the, the Zoom uh, benefits, right? <laughs> but, but before we allow you right now, you're gonna you, you interrupt it for like I think we cut off for like one minute or like not really. Sorry, really can nice. you guys hear me? Yeah, now it's <clears throat> yes. All right, so I'm curious to see um, or hear um, maybe briefly about uh, somebody like Tom Main's relationship to uh, this media. Uh, since he does come from uh, maybe a very traditional way of working, so how maybe uh, his views have evolved over time? So, um, I mean, I can open it. If you can talk about that. <laughs> um, definitely. I mean, that's a very tough uh, question, I can say, because, you know, like, you are, you're crashing against a, a generation, especially domain in particular, of, like, you know, star architect, where there is a very superimposed um, style that is uh, continuous through the work. Like there is no building that detached from a specific uh, style. So like, you know, essentially when you're pro prototyping and you're doing things, they of course don't look great at the first tries, especially when you're dealing with techniques that have been developed day by day and you use SDK that are published literally two or three days before you're doing that prototype. Uh, like sometimes it's very hard to communicate and uh, you need to play almost politically to try to find your way around, you know, to say this is something valuable, this is something that can be done. Um, mo most of the time if I, let's say, win, let's say, a debate between let's do it or not do it, it's because it's fast. It's because it's something very quick, like especially for um, visualization that it's half animation, half interactive. This sort of, let me just see a 3D viewer of this room or let, what if we just can teleport in this specific spot and not in the other one? What if we can see the things together, but we need this like in two days? Can you render a space for, of, I don't know, I don't know, a, a urban space in two days? I'm like, these are like impossible questions, right? That often are presented to you as a designer, I think. I'm not the only one that like is probably in the spot to do to say like do this in a very short amount of time. And I think the unity comes out very handy in these situations because like you know, like you can render essentially things that are very high quality in a very small amount of time. And uh, if you talked about it nicely in a, in a nice way, you can find your way around. On the other, on the other hand, uh, I have to say sometimes it's very hard to, um, and probably this is why we are we are taking this XR field as a something needed for architecture, or we are taking this opportunity also like a, a transition or something that can mean the future for the field because I feel that a lot of a lot of firms have a lot of difficulties to relate to these medias. Um, I have a lot of difficulties to understand how it works. Not everyone has a headset in the office. Um, everyone sees me like, you know, the VR guy when they pass through my desk. Uh, but the truth is that anyone can do it and anyone could have a, a headset on his desk and we could just look around stuff together. It's not, I think there is still, unfortunately, time goes relatively slow in these terms. Like, you know, like days, they still understand like the, there is the VR location in the office. Meanwhile, the VR is not the VR itself. It's just like the way to see things differently. 
um, I think um, Tomain had a lot of discussion with uh, Neil Leach. Uh, he came to the office, uh, especially, I, I know that it was yesterday or today that they had a panel together too. Yeah, last night. Last night. They, 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 they were talking about AI and the implementation of AI. Uh, just to, to put something there that can relate. I, I think that a lot of designers in Morphosis Sirens. <laughs> Full sound. <laughs> Sorry about that. And it's all day. And, but um, what I wanted to say is that like a lot of designer in Morphosis uh, actually used a lot of this now, nowadays called AI components of machine learning, but the way they design many of the building, it's pretty much very similar to what Unity does in uh, machine learning algorithm. You have a lot of possibilities and it goes through a lot of iteration and then it gets out the best ones and you give it an instruction, you let it run and it goes through. Like this is probably do it in a very slower way uh, with Grasshopper or Katia often. But the fact is that the, the, the mind of the things, like the, the mind which designers are building things is very, very close to what are the new techniques of creating or generating things. And this applies also to ripple spaces. So I think that indirectly they're very related to it, especially to main, but it's very hard to need to be good to communicate ideas. Rob, that's the toughest part. One last short question, going back to the idea of, uh, let's say one VR headset per desk. Uh, Chris, you talked about the, the fact that uh, this semester or this past uh, year at Cornell, um, students were actually uh, given the opportunity to um, have one device per desk. Uh, actually, I was teaching the, the post-professional students this semester before that last summer, and they were very excited about the opportunity of starting a whole studio in VR, but also having access to the devices. Most of us uh, in places that we work or where we studied, you had to make an appointment, there was a special lab, special access, so even when you get to a level where you are able to have these conversations again, uh, the, 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 they're not readily available. And, and this goes back to what Fullogram is doing, which is great. You are kind of creating a flexibility. So I was wondering if you guys, um, um, Adam and Chris, if you can talk about uh, maybe uh, what you learn from or the difference uh, when your students do have access to these devices they are on their desk or, or when, you know, it is mobile based and it's as simple as just deploying it to different, uh, different formats. So I'm curious if you can maybe gauge um, that accessibility um, to maybe a previous experience. Yeah, so it's definitely a different type of experience or a different relationship with the technology when you have it yourself versus when it's over there in the room and you have to reserve it. Uh, so, you know, at, at shop, you've had VR for a while and, and everyone has embraced it to the point where, the, you know, they, they're using Enscape a lot and, and we don't actually have to interact that much with people. They just, they do Enscape and then they go and they put it on, but it's, it's not a design tool. It's a review tool, right? They, they're designing in Rhino and then they'll have a big meeting and they'll go into the headset and they'll look around and they'll talk about it and they'll make changes. And that's a very different thing than I'm designing. I put on the headset for two seconds. I take it off. I move things. I put the headset on. I take it back off. Um, and so I think having that relationship uh, where where you can go back and forth, it's not one or the other. It's, it's taking the advantages of both. Uh, it definitely changes the, the sort of way that you use it or the way you think about it as a tool. Um, it, it's tough to get there, the, both the, the space requirements, the cost requirements. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that we, we should have one per desk necessarily, but it it does, I think, need to get to the point where they're, they're ubiquitous, where you don't have to sort of reserve it and wait for it, where it's something that you can use uh, in real time with what you're designing. And I, I don't think the, the answer, you know, some, some people are going towards, well, let's just make tools in VR so that you can manipulate and design while you're in the headset. And those are, are great, but I don't think those are the answer. I think the answer is the combination of both. Um, I'll also just add that you know one of the, the great things about uh, 
fullogram you know, having the the phone there AR is something that everybody does have um, and there, there's a lot to be said for uh, being able to share experiences so even even when you are all in headsets you're still potentially separated in the headset so it's one thing for everyone to have a headset it's a different thing for everybody to be able to share that experience um, and so that's a, just an additional sort of consideration when, when talking about this. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, yeah. Just really quickly on that one, uh, this will take two seconds. The accessibility thing is so, so critical. The difference between it taking 30 seconds or a minute to get into an immersive experience and it taking five seconds is actually the difference between people doing it and not doing it. And it seems so trivial, but it's really important. Um, it, it makes something natural and just like an extension of a, it doesn't break a flow state. It doesn't make you physically move to another space. It's just there. Um, and I think like any, any serious experience designed for AR, VR, it needs to be super accessible if you want uptake. We take him all on that if, if I can. I, I, actually, there's an interesting question. I wanted to ask two things. One, uh, let's assume that for the moment, I, I believe that we're in this kind of early, very early stage of, uh, of actually adopting. Adi, we have to wrap up soon now. Just, yes, uh, yeah. uh, okay, okay, then just a short question. What do you think the impact of uh, the moment where a big influencer like Apple or like Tesla or whoever may end up uh, coming up with a pair of let's say mixed reality tools or glasses or whatever they're calling that will be, let's say, affordable that's a bit relative, but they become the norm. I think they may standardize a lot in the in the market in the sense that everybody would like to copy or to have one. Everybody in school, students will start wearing this kind of fancy, no longer bulky system and so forth. And then the question was, how do you think this will impact uh, basically the, edu the accessibility in the education sector? Now we discussed this from the perspective of what's possible now. Right now we are talking about the students, but I'm just curious to see how do you see the education like happening differently within the span of 15 to 20 years, like not now. I mean, how do you think that the switch from the digital, for the pencil to the digital pencil and then to the whatever is coming next will be? That, that's maybe something interesting to look for from an educator perspective. I think most of us here also play this kind of double role of developers, creators, but also educators in some form or another. So, Chris. <laughs> I can start out this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think just as um, the, there has been a workshop right now at SciArc that is called DID, that is Design Immersion Days for high school uh, students, and they did like a Snapchat filter. So, and like that's for me a big shift, right? Because like you know what you imagine from model making and what it became actually because of social distancing and online lectures. And uh, what it became the importance of virtual space and how this ephemeral media became so fundamental to be learned because you essentially learn how to develop things through doing uh, filters. And I think that's very remarkable. I don't know if it's right or wrong. I just think it's a big change for sure. And uh, that might be that might be from education. Definitely, I can see I can see a lot of teachers at least like close to me that are taking a step forward for, for it. And I really appreciate the work of Christopher that I saw during the presentation in, uh, in, in kind of educating these students toward this new media too. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the adoption of, of these technologies as they, you know, educational systems are so thoroughly set that it takes a long time for, for them to get changed. Um, even you know, the computer, the internet, the phone, you know, we're still teaching people the same way that we were teaching them 20 years ago, even though the access to technology, the access to information and how, how we interact with that information is so fundamentally different than it was 20 years ago. But for the most part, the classrooms are very similar. I mean, okay, you have a computer, you have a phone, but they're still more similar than they are dissimilar. Um, AR glasses, ubiquitous AR glasses, I can't even begin to predict, you know, what, what those are going to do from a social point of view, you know, walking around and, and having facial recognition or, or putting hats on everybody as you're walking around or virtual dog. I mean, there's so many things that are, are going to fundamentally change when everybody has digital information, 3D immersive, readily available. I, I'm being a little pessimistic here. I don't know that education is going to be one of the things that changes that quickly.
All right, on that um, positive I hope I'm note. wrong. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, one thing that we've been facing, we're uh, teaching a student a forty uh, a forty student class um, with Claudio um, using Web VR and. It's quite interesting to see how many of them actually do have headsets and how many of them are trying to collaborate uh, in teams to, uh, you know, uh, to take advantage of each other's headsets. So maybe it would become similar to the 3D printing culture where people are starting to rely on one another. Maybe we'll have something uh, similar to uh, Uber for um, XR in a few years before it becomes more democratic and more accessible. Who knows? But um, I really want to thank the panel for uh, a very provocative uh, session. Uh, I think uh, I hope that everybody here is uh, optimistic about these tools, and that's why we're in this field. But um, it's, it was really nice to also bring up uh, some of our concerns and some of our uh, worries about the field, and also the uh, uh, let's say the how current uh, situation is also uh, making some of these predictions uneasy. But uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, and hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any closing comments, please go ahead. Just want to say thanks, Otherwise, everyone. Just want yeah. to thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, thank, thanks, 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 thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, we'll edit all the little little things uh yeah we had a had couple of those and uh yeah it's but higher. uh yeah and then this would be um this would be uh air uh, this would air um t tomorrow morning early morning uh psd uh it's gonna be i believe uh, uh noon uh gmt so i'll i'll, I'll let you guys know um as soon as it's up, and it's gonna, it's gonna uh, look like it's live, but it's gonna be a pre-recorded session, and then it will be there to replay. Yeah, we've had a couple of live sessions, and those are quite stressful. But this one is less stressful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, will we be there tomorrow for Q and A? Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. Q and A. And so, I don't have a link to tomorrow's session, like uh, as a presenter link or something for Q and A. Oh uh, no, this would be a YouTube link. Uh, so. Okay. Um, so, um, because right, it's, I think uh, I saw that. Yeah, so it, it's gonna um, because we have to schedule these talks. Um, it's gonna air at five a.m. Uh, PST, so eight a.m. Uh, AST. Uh, so we thought it would be quite easy to get everybody together. Um, it, it was. It would be quite difficult to get everybody together at that time. So uh, people do post comments, though. It's, it's quite active. So um, yeah. So. Yeah, sorry, we wouldn't be able to do that, uh, do this live again, unless everybody wants to wake up uh, early and, and do another session. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so right. it sounds like no Q&A uh, after, after the video. Yeah, because we don't really have an audience right now. Yeah. Got it, got it. Understood. Yeah, yeah, so this is pre-recorded. Oh no! Absolutely, I I meant uh, like we don't show up morning. tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> to tomorrow, tomorrow morning you would play this video and then we. Would yes, exactly. Yeah, so we would see questions. questions and and it's gonna be uh, streamed on YouTube and also Billy Billy, which is the Chinese version of yes. YouTube. So um, yeah, so I'll send you guys uh, both links. Uh, so there there's there'll be a live link and then it will be on the the YouTube playlist. Um. Sounds great. Thank yeah. you. Sounds good. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll be in touch. Have a Thank great you. day. It was, it was nice it was, to meet you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.